respect for. Really a great guy. His name is Alex Saunders, and he is with Nuggets News. And the reason I'm so excited to have him here is because he's not only a macro guy, but he really loves gold, loves silver, and he knows a lot about cryptocurrencies. So, Alex, welcome to the Rebel Capitalist Show. How's things anyway? Pretty crazy. I'm sure it's, sure it's the same on your end as well. Oh, just unbelievable. I can't believe what's happening in the markets and then with crypto. And um, I guess we've all sort of been thinking that this might happen one day and now it's kind of here. But yeah. Well, for sure. It's it's I mean, I don't think anyone would have been able to predict what's happening specifically with the coronavirus. But people like you and I and a lot of other people on YouTube and the Internet, probably not in the mainstream media, have been warning that the underlying fundamentals of the market are extremely flawed. And to take a quote from John Malden, it's just a bug in search of a windshield. And uh, the coronavirus just happened to be that windshield. So I, I don't think it's that, that you could say, yeah, no one saw this coming. It's true to a certain extent, but to look at the market and see the fragility of the market, I think if you're paying attention, you could have seen that from a mile away. What do you think? Yeah, well, I, I think it could have been any catalyst because the house of cards was a bit bit wobbly. So yeah, 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 exactly for sure. It's a perfect time to talk about crypto and Ethereum. I know a lot of my uh, viewers were asking more so about gold. You know, why is gold going down? Why is gold going down? Why is in it? I know it just tanked today, and I explained that in a couple videos. But and I, I mentioned in one of the videos that I think Bitcoin could potentially be going down for the same reasons gold is going down. So I'd really like to get your insights on first and foremost the macro environment and how that is playing into the current price, the price over the past two weeks, and then most likely the price in the next six months or year. For sure. Yeah, well, if you haven't checked the price in a week, George, it's down 30% today and about 25, well, 25% today. It's Just an absolute, today. absolute bloodbath. Yeah. Wow. So what was gold down? Gold was down huge today. I know not 30%, but it was down. What Do you have your charts in front of you? Yeah. Gold's down 3%, silver 5%. Hmm. Wow. So, okay. So if it's down 30%, that takes it down to what? Six, seven grand? Five and a half now. Yeah. Five and a half. Wow. I think, I still think it's a fantastic speculation. If you, if for my viewers, they know that the way I define that is just buying something because I think it's got a, an asymmetric component to it, to the upside where your downside's a lot uh, less than that upside, but I only like to do that with at, a, at the most 10% of my portfolio. But before all the gold guys rush in and say, yeah, 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 I told you so, I always like to point out as well that I only like 10% of my portfolio in gold. <laughs> and I think we had this conversation last time we spoke, and I just don't understand why there's kind of this Bitcoin camp and there's a gold camp when we're, we're looking at the exact same problems and we're, we're analyzing those problems the exact same way. And it's just one camp kind of goes this direction and the other. But in my mind, we're all on the same team. And I don't see why on earth you wouldn't own gold and Bitcoin, but just for two completely separate reasons. I always call them just it's like it's not even apples and oranges. I say it's like comparing oranges and Ford pickup trucks. That you just, and you know what's weird, and I'd like to get your feedback on this as well with your with your viewers and on your Twitter stream. It, it's weird to me how many people can't differentiate the reason for owning a specific asset. Like I'm owning this because it's cash flowing. I'm owning this because it's insurance. They conflate everything together, and they start by asking the question is this going to go up or down in price? And that they completely ignore, you know, they put the blinders on and ignore anything else. And I always get it on my, my live streams and everything where they say, well, 
you know, wh what do you think about Bitcoin right now? Or what do you think about gold? And I'll say, for what? It, it depends on what your objective is. And what, what do you have any feedback on that? So as you say, I think when most people get into any sort of investing world, they buy something that they think the price is going to go up. And then you go down that journey of, oh, there's different asset classes and there's different sectors for different times and different risk environments and, and this, that and the other. So as you say, a lot of the gold crowd, and I'm a big gold bull, as you remember from last time we spoke, yeah, sure. a lot of the arguments that they put forward, it's probably 80% the same arguments about Bitcoin as you know, hard money, you know, finite, it can't be printed by governments. Um, and then we obviously have the little sort of differentiators as well. So a lot of those hard money, sound money arguments are, I think, the most bullish catalyst for, for Bitcoin and gold today as the Fed have just announced, I'm not sure if you saw this, $1.5 trillion wow. stimulus. I, I for sure did. I've been tweeting about it all morning. What was crazy is I, I got up early just like you and the first thing that I saw is they inject 500 billion. So I tweet, I'm like, holy cow, the feds, or actually, I'm sorry. First thing I did is checked on the repos because I go to the New York feds website and I see what the, the terms, what the term repos were, what the overnight repos, and then what the oversubscribed was and on the terms usually. And I saw, and then they jumped it uh, this morning up to almost 200 billion and there was like 74 billion oversubscribed. So the first thing I did is tweet that. I'm like, wow, this is crazy. And with that tweet, I said, this is feeling a lot like 2008. And I would not be surprised if we had some, some 2008-like fireworks, I think is the exact term that I used. And sure enough, like two hours later, the Fed comes out with a $500 billion repo. And then like 30 minutes later, I see on CNBC that, that bumped it up to $1 trillion. And then 20 minutes later, I see they bump it up to $1.5 trillion over the next couple of days. Now, to be clear, these are term repos. But wow, that's it. I, I, I saw Jim Bianco put out something saying that that's more and I don't know by how much, but it was a big delta that that's a lot more in one day that they committed to than all of quantitative easing one to put it into perspective. 100%. I mean, so much has changed in the last few weeks. I was joking with a friend the other day that three weeks ago, the headlines were central banks to come together to save us from climate change. And that was the excuse <laughs> that they were trying to, to pin on, you know, the markets and the fragility and whatnot. And then I think it was two weeks ago when they said we're going to look to wind back those repo operations and we were saying, well, the markets are likely going to have a tantrum because you've probably seen that chart where it's very correlated to however much they're you know doing in the repo markets and their balance sheet, ba balance yeah. sheet expansion related to the uh, stock price. And sure enough, they tape it a little bit and then all this happens and it's going to be pinned on the coronavirus. And that's probably a one-two punch because that does have some really big structural implications. And we can talk about the health side of things, if you like, George, because I am a pharmacist and this is something I saw a month ago and said, this is different. This is going to be bad. But when you have the the debt burden, the, the, you know, the junk bond market, the corporate bond market from the energy sector, we've got this, this oil war now with OPEC, Russia and the Saudis. All these things can cause a house of cards on top of an already fragile market that was priced to perfection. Yeah. And this is a situation the world over. Somewhere like Australia, we have got record household debt. People put everything on their credit card, the afterpays. And now we're going to have an economy that's lost its tourism. We've lost so many students, Chinese students, for education. Um, you know, exports, minerals, they're all going to suffer, you know, recession, a global recession. And I think we're just in, we are a big house of cards in our economy. So I think everyone's going to be hit hard. But then you look at the individual countries uh, and health wise as well, if you want to get into that, there's some countries that are going to be hit even harder um, by the virus. Yeah, let's get into the, the health component of it, because I'd love to get your take on that. I interviewed Eric Townsend from Macro Voices, and we actually did a, a full like two hours diving into the coronavirus, but that was probably a month ago. And then, of course, Dr. Chris Martinson, I think everyone's been watching his videos. He's doing a fantastic job. But if you have any other take on that from a, an actual medicine standpoint, I know a lot of the drugs, the ingredients are sourced 
from China. Uh, so I'd, I'd love to get your take on that. But before we dive into that, how do you think, because you're right at ground zero there in Australia, and as Americans and people outside of Oz, we, we've always heard about your your housing bubble. So what is your take on that? How do you think this affects that? It is just such a cultural thing here. The Prime Minister comes out. It's all over breakfast TV every morning, every weekend, these property shows. How do you get on the property ladder? You've got to buy your first property. Property only ever goes up. So it's so deeply ingrained, and that's why I think it's been able to go on and just be so normalised because people, friends of mine, buy million-dollar houses, and they commit themselves to 30 years of paying 40% of their wages. And that's just not not normal in any other country around the globe. And there's places like where I live down in Tasmania, where our house with our um, you know income ratio was two or three. And so there are still pockets that are affordable. But then most other capital cities are getting towards you know seven, eight, nine. I think um, Melbourne or Sydney got up to twelve at one stage, and they've cut interest rates so aggressively that bubble's almost reinflated. It's only a few percent away from its peak. So that is one thing that hasn't dropped, like the stock market and everything else. So I do think that that is going to uh, deflate once again. Do you guys have fixed rate mortgages there, or if you do, how long do they fix them? You can choose to fix for a few years. Um, most people have variable rates, um, but yeah, you can't fix longer than, or I'm going to say maybe three to five years tops. All right. So you don't have a 30 year fixed rate like we do in the States. No, um, correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, but no, I don't think so. No. Yeah. So that's So just for those people watching that don't understand the, the correlation in the United States, we, we have our 30 year fixed rate loan, which the majority of people have. And as Americans, I don't think they realize that that's actually sub, uh, subsidized by the government or the taxpayer through Fannie and Freddie, and that uh, a, a normal bank in a free market would never keep a 30-year fixed rate loan on their books because they have so much inflation risk. Mm -hmm. So the way that we do that in the States is you go to your Wells Fargo, your Bank of America, you get out that 30-year fixed rate debt, and it's before the ink is dry, Bank of America has sold that paper or that loan to Fannie and Freddie. So, bam, it's clean. It's off their books. They don't have any liability whatsoever. And if you've got a banking system, which in my opinion is a lot more healthy, where they do have to keep the, those assets, uh, quote unquote, on their books, then they're not going to they're not going to do that 30 year fixed rate because that's going to be a money loser almost every single time. And so my point is, if you've got those variable rates, if interest rates were to go up for whatever reason, and, and we as humans have this recency bias that we think that because rates haven't been, or because they've been almost zero for, call it 10, 12 years, we think it's just going to be like that for the next 100 years. But we forget about inflation. We forget about the 1970s and other things, too, like in the States that we can see the Fed is losing control over the short end of the yield curve without there being this 1970s type of event. And so if those adjust and the people can't afford the mortgage, then you have the same type of issue that we had here in 2008, 2009. So I just wanted yeah. to clarify that. But the only other thing I would add is that Australia's banks are the most uh, systemically exposed to the mortgage market in the world. So their really? books are just majority mortgages and small business lending has really declined because banks are going, hey, we can lend out these million dollar mortgages at 5%, you know, and, and they just want to give everyone a mortgage. They don't want to lend a small, small business. Why would you risk that when you can give out these mortgages? Um, it's just, it's all a big and, house of cards. And they're, they're keeping the mortgages on their books or do you guys have a system there where they're selling them to some sort of government or government sponsored entity no we don't have a mortgage-backed security system and again this isn't something that i'm an expert in but i know when we we're talking about doing qe it was very different to how the fed was going to operate where they bought a lot of those mortgages back in australia doesn't really have that market and i think that's got to do with what you were saying about keeping it on your books with the um, variable rates and whatnot Okay. So let's go into your side of the coronavirus story from a pharmacist standpoint and looking at the drugs and uh, the components of that medicine and the generic drugs, I think is a, a big part of it. I read like 90% of, of generic drugs, they're, they're sourced, the ingredients 
in China. But what are your insights there? Definitely through globalization, we've become really dependent on India and China for a lot of generic drugs, as you say, but a lot of just um, antibiotics and things that are irreplaceable, really. So if we get into this real trade war, you know, imagine a situation where China say or India say we're not going to give you antibiotics to the US. So we're just I think this is going to make people rethink globalization. Uh, and outsourcing of cheap labor. So what are the costs versus the benefits? In terms of coronavirus, um, Chris Martinson has done a wonderful job, as you say. He's such a smart guy. He actually started my journey down the rabbit hole with Mike Maloney 10 years or so ago with his peak yeah. prosperity videos. So there you yeah, go. Right. But um, I think we're hearing these reports now that the virus can survive on surfaces for possibly even days at a time. Um, so there's all these little things that make it different to the flu in terms of its characteristics, while the symptoms may not be that much worse than the flu for the average, you know, the average Joe. And I think that's where the message is still really confused, where people are saying the media are overblowing this and they're using it to blame the stock market crash. That's kind of true, but this is actually really bad. And that's why I said before, this is a one-two punch. And that's why we've seen the markets have the nastiest reaction since the GFC. In the US, they're still not taking it seriously. Trump's tweeting yesterday, oh, this is the flu. This is how many people die. This is the, you know, coronavirus numbers. Everyone's making a big deal out of it. In Australia, yesterday our prime minister was telling people to go to the football. So where we have the big crowds of you know 30, 50, 70 thousand people. And wow. last weekend we had a cricket World Cup game at one of the football grounds, and there's been confirmed cases of coronavirus um, at the match. So. The only way to contain this is to go into complete lockdown, and everyone needs to sacrifice a little bit in the short term if you're any hope of eradicating it. But unfortunately, our leaders are just still not taking it seriously. And when you read some of the threads, as I'm sure you have on Twitter, from the doctors, the guys at the coalface in Italy, ICU wards, this is this is really, really nasty. And we're at this cluster, cluster, cluster stage in some countries. I think in Australia and the US, we're still in the case, case, case stage yep. and we're about to go into the cluster and then the parabolic boom and by then it's really too late because we know that incubation period they're talking about possibly five days but we've still got these cases that are 14 or even longer in melbourne in perth in western australia in the big cities in australia they're preparing for like military style hundreds of thousands of cases and testing and uh well they work in pathology labs and pathology. they're doctors and it's basically if you, any type of doctor is going to be a pandemic doctor once this once shit hits the fan. So surgeons will just become, you know, coronavirus doctors. It's all hands on deck. Yeah, right. So uh, how how's the the hospital bed situation there? Is it, is it like our situation in the United States where it's just not even close to sufficient? Uh, another thing our Prime Minister has been saying was a bit like Trump. Um, you know, we're working with our hospitals to free up extra capacity of beds. And then you, you talk to the doctors or see them on Twitter and they're saying like, you know, we're understaffed and we're, we've got people in the emergency rooms and in the hallways already. Like, you're kidding yourself. Yeah. Right now they do? It's it's so like in Tasmania where I live, it's shocking. Like they're always full. The waiting lists are huge. Yeah. Oh, this is, oh, I see. This is with excluding the coronavirus. So they're they're at full capacity even without this. So even if you only had, call it, uh, uh, let's say, twenty thousand cases where they needed hospitalization in Australia, that would completely overwhelm the the system. Um, definitely in in some places, maybe not in the big cities, in the biggest hospitals to start with, but it takes three weeks for some of these people to recover. So once they're in a bed, they're there for three weeks, you're getting all these new cases every day. Yeah, it's going to get nasty. Yeah, and I was reading, it, and it's the little things that you don't think about with the the not having a supply of face masks. I know that the, the healthcare system in the United States is dealing with that where they're running out of face masks. So the nurses and the doctors are like, well, what am I supposed to do if I, you know, you really want me to go in and try to treat this patient, which I, it's, I feel obligated to, but on the same hand, I don't want to get the virus and, and go take it to my family and then maybe jeopardize the health or the life of my grandparent or my older father or mother. It, it becomes this really difficult moral decision 
and and there are no good choices. And what most people don't understand is it's not about the death rate at all. And although the death rate is substantially higher than the flu, it's it's still it's still lower than like a SARS. But but they don't look at the next five steps. They just see that. And you got to think about what the serious complication rate is of the virus. So number one, it spreads almost four times faster than the flu because the R naught value of the flu, I think right around 1.28. And from what I've seen with Eric and a lot of other studies and, and Dr. Chris Martinson, you're looking at around four for, so that means that for every one person that has the coronavirus, they'll spread it to four people if it's not contained. Now, obviously, if they're in their house uh, self-quarantine, they're not going to spread it to that many people. The, the flu would just be 1.28 people. So number one, it's spreading a lot faster if you're nonchalant about it, like the United States and it sounds like Australia. But then you have a serious complication rate of around 10%. That's, that's compared to maybe 1% with the flu. Okay, so then if you walk through that math, the United States has about 900,000 hospital beds. Now, this is not, these are not ICU beds, which, uh, which would mostly be required for this type of infection. These are just hospital beds. 68% of them are typically in use. So that leaves you with right around 300,000 beds. Okay, well, let's just assume that the same amount of Americans get the coronavirus that got the uh, that normally get the flu. And that's right around 20 million Americans per year get the flu. Okay, well, that puts you at 2 million people that need to be hospitalized. You got 300,000 beds people don't connect those dots and they say, well, okay, maybe they can just double up a room. No, that's not how it works because you run out of all the equipment that you need to give the person the medical attention that is required to save their life. And it boils down to like in Italy right now, we're seeing all these reports from doctors. This is not from just crazy tinfoil hat people. This is from doctors and nurses saying that they, that they're in they're having like emotional breakdowns because they're literally put into a situation where you have two people show up to the hospital, both needing care to save their life. And they could save their lives, but, th but they just don't have the resources. So they've got to choose, okay, do we save this person's life or do we save that person's life? And then you've got to think about all the other people out there that get into motorcycle accidents that, that have, uh, a brain tumor, have a stroke, have cancer, have, have whatever. Well, you're taking resources away from those people as well. So it's this overwhelming of the hospital system. That's the problem. It's not necessarily just comparing the death rate, which is, let's call it two, three percent, compared to the death rate of the flu and just saying, well, it's a little bit worse, but ah, no big deal. It just affects older people. Uh, another thing, and I'm sorry for going off on a tangent here, but I don't think most people, especially Americans, know this either. And I know this is becoming a big problem in Australia, is there's certain risk factors that make it far, far worse. We've heard of, oh, oh it affects uh, elderly far more than it affects young people. That's true, but that's just one risk factor that increases the, the potency of the virus. Another one is smoking, which of course makes a lot of sense because it's a respiratory thing. But number three is what nobody is talking about. That's obesity. So if you look at the United States, and I don't know the last time you've been to, to the U.S., but 45% of Americans are obese, 45%. So hmm. how does that work when you've got this attitude that's just, oh, nonchalant, let's just go out to the football games, and, and Trump is tweeting, oh, it's no big deal, here's the numbers. And then you've got this hospital system combined with the fact that everyone is, or not everyone, but uh, you know, 45% of the people are obese. And I, I use this quote on a video the other day, but it reminded me of that uh, quote from Wayne Gretzky, 
where he says, the reason I was so successful is because I always skated to where the puck was going to be and not where it had already been. Mm-hmm. And, and Trump is a great example of he's looking at where the puck is right now and he's completely ignoring where the puck is going to be in two or three weeks. Exactly. That was what I was going to talk about next. So it's not only um, obesity, it's hypertension, um, blood sugar levels, so all your diabetics. Um, sadly, Australia actually passed America as the number one obese nation in the world a few years right. a few years back. But you guys leapfrogged us again, believe it or not. So, yeah, it's just those... It's those mental constraints on the people if they get infected, those staff have to stay at home. It gets through nursing home and aged care facilities when we have an aging population. I've worked firsthand there when there's been things like gastro outbreaks and the staff get nervous. They don't want to work. They think they're sick. They've got to stay home. Then the rest of them that are working are short-staffed and doing double shifts. So these are the compounding effects. And it's it's not so much even all that. At the end of the day, I think we'll we'll get past that, even if it takes a year or two to find a vaccine, yeah, totally possibly, totally. possibly medication. It's the the slowing down and if you only contain it 90 percent, and then you let everyone go back to work it's going to rebound again so until you eradicate it all together that is going to just bring the economy to a halt and we've seen those numbers in china you know 95 percent down with tv manufacturing auto manufacturing i just don't know how some of these you know the price of copper and iron ore and some of these things has got a lot further to drop in my opinion yeah for sure And so from, I mean, you know, the medical side of it so much better than I do. Correct me if I'm wrong, but the flu tends to go down in the winter because we get some uh, some heat, but then it goes right back up in the fall. So we could see something with the coronavirus where we just get hammered for the next month or month and a half. Then it settles down. Everyone goes back to being lackadaisical and says, okay, well, we've beat this, no problem. Let's get back out and start enjoying our life again. And then the markets go up and then the fall hits and we get it twice as bad as we had it in the spring and it just blindsides us again. Yeah, I mean, this is something that we don't know the exact science behind, but it's generally thought that in winter, more people are inside, crowded together, in front of the heater, um, indoors, in restaurants and at home. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely... Well, so it's not necessarily a, a temperature thing. It's just people are, are in more confined spaces, typically. We also have some viruses that do have uh, properties where they'll survive better on surfaces at certain temperatures. So every virus or bacteria has its different properties, but it does look like this has a component of seasonality, as you say. So maybe the US is going to face the worst of it coming weeks, but Australia, you know, in three months time heading into our winter, if it's not gone by then, you know, we'd be facing a harder battle. Yeah. All right. So we've discussed that. Everyone gets it. How does this pertain to Bitcoin? Okay. So where do we start? I mean, Bitcoin (laughs) is taking a belting today as I'm looking at my charts. But I think this is, it's it's a black swan. It's unprecedented. And I think it very much parallels gold. So anyone that traded during the GFC knows that gold sold off very sharply. And even the other day, gold had that big sell off day in the liquidations. And then it bounced back when people, again, rotate money into it and see it as a safe haven or, or bond yields are getting crushed. So there's all these reasons to still go into gold. Nothing has really changed fundamentally for Bitcoin in this world where we're going to be living from home, possibly, and uh, working from working from home payments. It sort of has that uh, bullish feel to it still, I think, for Bitcoin and cryptocurrency. But it's not acting as a safe haven as a lot of us would have loved. It's definitely acting like a risk asset and selling off with stocks and everything else. But when we have these announcements about you know rate cuts, Trillion dollar QE, talk of MMT. We got the handouts in Hong Kong, the helicopter money. We got those yesterday in Australia as well. I so, yeah. I mean, I think I saw that on your Twitter feed. You couldn't make a more uh, bullish environment for gold and Bitcoin, but it just is going to take that that dust to settle. And then gold went on that multi year bull market. And I very much think that Bitcoin could do the same. Yeah, so do I. And I think gold will, will do the same as well. I was actually looking at some of the miners today and trying to determine if it's if now is a good time to go into like a silver miner or a gold miner just because they have just taken a beating and even more so than than gold but for just 
for those people who don't really understand why this could just be taking a, a pounding, and I'm talking about gold and Bitcoin, going back to what Alex was saying in 2008, if you look at charts, you can see that gold kind of topped out right when we had Bear Stearns. And then it just crashed down after that. And it kind of, it went up and down, up and down, but then went all the way down till we got to Lehman, then went shooting up for a week or two and then came crashing down again. So you're asking yourself, well, what on earth is going on? I think we look at a safe haven asset is, is something that only has one cross current. It's either got tailwind or headwind. It's, it's binary, right? And what we have to understand, and I'm sure this is, it's the same with Bitcoin, is there's several cross currents that are happening at one time. And sometimes you can have one of those currents that's far stronger than the other. And, and then, you get, you, then you get this big tidal wave coming from this side. And in, in 2008 with gold, it was the, the three main cross currents were fear, collateral, and liquidity. So when I say collateral, that means when these entities that probably held a lot of gold needed to go into the repo market, they needed liquidity. They couldn't get liquidity and they couldn't use their collateral because the collateral that they had were all these mortgage-backed securities where the repo market was just puking those out and saying, no, 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 we, we don't want to take the risk. We don't want anything associated with a mortgage-backed security. Well, if that's all your collateral and you need liquidity to stay afloat, you're going to sell anything that you possibly can. And so that turned out to be gold. And then what happens is when you see the government come in and like ban short selling on Fannie and Freddie, then all of a sudden uh, you've got the, uh, you know, that takes its toll on gold. That affects the price. So you have all this battle going on. Then what happens is when the repo fails after Lehman go down to where they were kind of in the normal range and the Fed announced all this quantitative easing, all this money printing, all the expansion of the balance sheet, then the fear took over and the fundamentals took over and gold, to your point, went on that huge, huge bull run. And I think it's going to be the same with gold, the miners, and most likely with Bitcoin. Now, does that happen in three months or six months? I have no idea. Yeah, I think with price discovery, we know that the GLD and paper gold is probably a separate market to the physical market in some respects. And there's a lot of leverage in the futures markets. Uh, there's a lot of longs at the moment. So when we get that cascade, we can get those sharp moves. And even more so in Bitcoin, when you think about price discovery, the majority of volume comes from these exchanges with 100 times leverage. And when we get that flash crash like yesterday, it just turns into a $1,000. Next thing you know, we're down $2,000. But is that a true representation of Bitcoin's price or value from one day to another? Probably not. Can you explain that, Alex? And it, I think for most of my viewers who are kind of more into gold or, or real estate, they're not really going to understand the dynamics of, of Bitcoin and how it's bought and sold and why that can lead to that flash crash. So can you unpack that a little bit? Well, the majority of exchanges where you buy your Bitcoin or cryptocurrency with your fiat money, you link mm. your bank account and whatnot, and you can keep your Bitcoin there or you can withdraw it and store it yourself so, uh, safely, which I recommend you do. But if you're a trader and you want to trade the charts up and down each day, you have your crypto on the exchange and you can use leverage. And they'll, most of these exchanges now have up to 100 times leverage. You're so if you have a, a- On Bitcoin? Yeah, and all these altcoins. So these things are moving 30% uh -huh. in a day and you can 100 times leverage that. And that's what a lot of traders do. But what that means is when you have a 1% move against you, you get liquidated. So oh, when yeah. we have these big How moves- how, they can, how can they give them 100 times leverage? How, I don't see how that business model works. That, uh, well, well, they close your position you when get a margin moves. call. You get you a margin get a mar call. Okay, and that's why it. we start these margin call cascades, similar to a financial crisis, I guess. And these things just, just trigger and liquidate. And you watch these big red yeah. candles, and then we end up 30% down. So, hmm. Wow. All right, so let's talk about when the dust settles, like it did in 2008. You've got the Fed coming out, and, and let's first go over the fundamentals of uh, Bitcoin. 
or what most people who are, are bullish Bitcoin would consider the fundamentals. So maybe the, the people who aren't as familiar with that can understand that very similar to gold, that uh, the, the money printing, the, the, the Fed coming in and doing quantitative easing, artificially low interest rates, the government coming in and, and doing all this fiscal stimulus and deficit spending, you're just inflating the, the currency into oblivion. Whether it happens short term, it will most likely definitely happen long term over the next five to 10 years and, and above. But Bitcoin is finite. It's, it's 21 million, as I understand. And it's the same argument that you would have for gold. So, so if I missed anything there, let me know. And then based on those fundamentals and then what we saw today from the Fed announcing this $1.5 trillion in repo. And I think what's even more important with that, Alex, is they announced the $1.5 trillion in repo and the market still goes down by 2,000 points. I mean, it, that that's, I think, the story potentially of the year. The, the two things that they they dropped at 50 basis points the market still goes down by 700 they announced 1.5 trillion of additional liquidity balance sheet expansion and the the market goes up i think for maybe what two five ten minutes and then completely tanks and goes to even lower lows i know it's down even more than 2,000 points but how is that not a, a red flag yeah, I'm not sure uh, what time you'll get this interview up, George, but I think we are setting up for a fireworks of a Friday trading session because once you've, yeah. play, you've played your cards, um, as you say, and the market's still down, and I think we're going to see more cases continue to increase, particularly in the US, over the weekend, and that can set up a brutal Monday as well. So let's see how that plays out. In terms of Bitcoin, there's three aspects to it. So we have that currency aspect where it's finite. Now that's also digital, which gives it some advantages over gold because as we did in our last video, I can send you money anywhere in the world. Yeah. Uh, I haven't a, spent them yet, Alex. I'm saving them. <laughs> it's probably worth a bit less now, George. So you have to hold them. Yeah. But uh, okay. it's also a payments network, as we as we have uh, spoken about. Whether it's micro transactions we're trying to do in the Lightning Network, or it's um, you know someone that's sending a million dollars or a billion dollars over this network and it only costs them ten or twenty dollars. Uh, that's you know for maximum security, you'd probably pay a bit more. So it's still a decent payments network. It's a bit like the internet in the early days where we've got to upgrade it to uh, fiber from dial up. So that's what we're working on upgrading Bitcoin. We're also upgrading it to be more private. Uh, and then the final thing I'd say to people is this doesn't get spoken about anywhere near enough. It is the world's most secure computer network, relatively speaking. So recently we've seen Microsoft announce that they're going to build their new um, identification product on mm. Bitcoin. There's lots of other little projects that are piggybacking on, off, bi off on Bitcoin. On Bitcoin or the blockchain? On Bitcoin's blockchain. On the blockchain, okay. Because those are two separate things, aren't they? Well, you ha it is Bitcoin's blockchain. And there's lots oh, of okay. different blockchains, but you have, okay. bi you have Bitcoins on the Bitcoin blockchain as well. Okay, so you can have a blockchain without Bitcoin, but you can't have Bitcoin without the Bitcoin blockchain. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I was throwing a tongue twister there. <laughs> All right. So how does Ripple play into this? Or Ethereum? So, I think you're more of an expert on Ethereum, right? So, yeah, there's lots of different cryptocurrencies that sprung up around five years ago, and they were just trying to be digital currencies like like mm. copycats of Bitcoin with slightly different features. Now, something like Ripple said, hey, we want to try and replace the SWIFT system that the banks use. So that was different in nature to something like Bitcoin that was trying to be a decentralized money and move away from the banks and governments and you know be a fair bit libertarian cyberpunk sort of stuff. Whereas the Ripple crowd is saying, you know, we're not too fussed about that. We think there's a huge industry um, that we can disrupt, you know, trillions of dollars of Forex markets and remittance markets and global payments. So we want to build this new system that's a settlement system for banks and payment providers. So that's that's the angle that XRP have gone down. Um, something like Ethereum is different again. So they, in some ways, Ethereum, the, the token, the cryptocurrency can be used as a money or a payment system, but it has mm -hmm. inbuilt smart contracts, which means you can build all sorts of uh, programs or applications or software. So they're trying to almost say, you know what, the internet 
didn't pan out the way we thought and all the value accrued to the Facebooks of the world, the Googles, the YouTubes, they have all our data. So let's build a new internet where it gives the power back to the people. So anyone can run an app. If you put up a status that Twitter don't like, there's no company, there's no centralized company to ban your account or, or take down your YouTube video because we say the word coronavirus too often. So this is building a decentralized internet and anyone can build an app or a program or any software on the Ethereum blockchain and Ether uh, is the underlying cryptocurrency that powers all of that. Okay, so how did the prices do with Ether and, and Ripple? Is it same as Bitcoin? Very highly popular? correlated and altcoins generally display beta. So uh, Bitcoin's down about 30%, altcoins are down between 30 and 40%. Okay. All right. So, what are you telling your your followers and and your uh, people and your the, get your newsletter as far as what to do right now? Are you just telling them to, to hold tight and see how this plays out, or to maybe take some of your dry powder and and buy a little, or, or what, what's your? Well, in in terms of other asset markets, we did a video the day before the market topped called "Global Asset Bubble: The World Has Gone Mad" because when we saw all that rush into uni students downloading the Robin Hood app and putting on Reddit how rich they had made, how much money they'd made from Tesla. It just got insane. So that to me was the yeah. off top. Um, I was pretty defensive in my retirement accounts and my share accounts already. Um, so yeah, we've got a bit of cash on the sidelines. In terms of crypto, that's always been a long-term play. So yeah. I've, I've been you know holding my Bitcoin since 2012. You take some profits when we have these big peaks. Um, when I want to buy something in the real world, you know, if you can buy a new car or put a, a payment down on a new house or something like that, you know, but you've got to be prepared to ride out these waves. Uh, we're going to have 40% drops. We've had an 80% drop. I really think that we're going far, far higher uh, in the longer term. So, yes, uh, this is a black swan event. It's a nasty sell off. It's probably going to continue to go lower as long as it keeps correlating to the stock market at the moment. And does that mean drag uh, gold gets dragged down, Bitcoin gets dragged down? Uh, possibly, but um, I'm very happy still hodling. And if it goes a lot lower, then I, I'd, I would buy more because if the fundamentals had changed, then um, I would sell and I'd tell people that. But yeah. it's never been more bullish. If you had told me in 2012 that the Fed would be printing trillions of dollars and rates would be zero, uh, the repo market will be blowing up. People will be talking about negative interest rates and banning cash. Now they're saying cash is bad because it has germs. You know, yeah. everything that we are looking at is bullish for cryptocurrency. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. So can you expand? I just saw an article, I think it was yesterday, saying that the, I don't know if it was the Fed or one of the central banks was considering or just saying, hey, this is a reason why we want to ban cash or we're collecting the cash because it's not safe to use because it could spread the coronavirus and them maybe using this as an excuse to collect all that cash and say, oh, well, you're better off without it anyway. And next thing we know, six months from now, cash is banned and we've got a new government backed digital currency and it goes back to that old political saying where you never let a good crisis go to waste. It's a lot like 9-11 where out of that we got TSA and the, 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 the Patriot Act and all these things that took, a lot, took away so many of our civil, civil liberties. Yeah, so we saw it in um, China to begin with. They were trying to stop the spread, so um, trying to get rid of cash. The U.S., I think they quarantined a lot of the cash that was coming in from other countries yeah, to be safe. Talk. Um, in Australia, they've really pushed this hard and under the radar, pushing things through Senate on Friday evenings when no one's watching and trying to pass this bill where people can't pay for goods or services over $10,000 with, with cash. Uh, they already want to possibly move to reduce that to $2,000. There's wording in there to include Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. And now they're talking about, yeah, possibly germs and whatnot as well so we know that they're going to try every excuse under the sun george um, we've got to fight and stand up against that uh, so far people have done a really good job uh, in australia of fighting this cash ban bill um, and at the end of the day you really can't stop someone using bitcoin it's just software you can use it on any computer any phone um, so even if they do try and ban it it's pretty unstoppable how 
was that the the wording in that law? How did that pertain to Bitcoin? I, I've never heard of that. So the wording in the law in Australia was uh, at the moment it's an exemption, but to remove an exemption isn't something that has to get voted on by Parliament. That is something that they can just decide to do to remove exemptions. So one day when they decide that they don't like Bitcoin and cryptocurrency either, um, they can just choose and make that um, make that banned overnight, basically. Wow. So in this bill that they're proposing to ban cash, they just nonchalant threw in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies just in case they people start to probably use that when they come out with their own digital currency and try to force people to use that. If there is enough people that say, no, screw you, I'm going to use my Bitcoin, then they, they always have that clause in there where, where they could uh, they could still ban Bitcoin and the use of that to force everyone legally to use whatever digital coin they come up with. Yeah, and just to have a little bit of a rant about our central bank, because I know the Fed cops a fair bit of heat, but you know, in Australia, in December 2018, they were very confidently saying about how strong the housing market was in our economy, and they were going to raise interest rates. And we were saying, there's no way you guys are going to raise interest rates. And sure enough, they had to do a backflip. And then recently, you know, they were saying that QE is extremely unlikely and negative interest rates are extremely unlikely. Uh, and sure enough, here we are. And they only did a 25 basis cut point cut when all the other central banks went 50 because they've said that they've only got one more left now and then they're going to start printing money. Literally last month, they said this was all extremely unlikely. Um, the month before that, they said that there's, you know, cryptocurrencies or government issued cryptocurrencies are, you know, a fad. They're not going to work. A month later, they said, yeah, we've been working on an Australian cryptocurrency. We've been experimenting on Ethereum, actually. Uh, and this is looking like something that's likely. So these guys have just lost all credibility. It is so frustrating watching our prime minister tell people to go to the footy, watching our central bank tell people this is going to happen and it's not. And um, that's, I guess, what drives me every day to give people the, the truth and what's really going on. Yeah. Wow. I can't believe that. It's just you You should just whatever they say, you should just assume that they mean the complete opposite of that. It's your trading account would be very healthy if you took the opposite of what they said. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. All right. Well, what do you expect for tomorrow and then next week? So I think this interview will probably come out this weekend. So just to be clear, today is Thursday, March. Uh, well, Friday well, morning in Australia. <laughs> Friday morning for you. It's Thursday afternoon for me, Thursday the 12th. So this comes out this weekend. What are you looking forward to maybe in the U.S. markets, the Aussie markets on Friday and then going into next week? So I think looking forward in the next couple of weeks, my predictions haven't changed from a month ago when I think we're about to see clusters and spikes in a lot of European countries in the US, which is going to be the, the global headline news once we start to yeah. see big cases there. Someone like Trump gets it. He shook hands with the, um, uh, I can't remember what it was. With, get a yeah. meeting with A meeting so, with him at his golf course. And yeah, the Brazilian so, uh, uh, official. Yeah, anyway. So anything like that that happens, I think that's when we're going to see the, the height of fear in the markets. And I think the markets are going to go lower. There might be a bounce coming soon, but I think over the next month, we're going to go lower and we're going to form a bottom before we actually see the worst of it. So the markets are going to bottom before the coronavirus gets to its very worst, you know, the peaking cases and all that sort of thing. So I think that uh, one of the things I always say, uh, George, is that sentiment drives markets at the end of the day. And we are getting very, very fearful at the moment. So maybe we're due for a relief rally. We've seen some huge once in a lifetime moves already. But at the same time, I think to myself, well, we we're so overvalued and yeah. we've had this, this one, two punch um, uh, three punches in Australia with the bushfires, we probably deserve to be 30% lower. And these markets are still pretty lofty by historical standards. So I'd say to people at home, be patient. If you've got your cash on the sidelines, I think there's going to be a long uh, list of stocks on your shopping list that you're going to be able to get for lower prices. And don't try and pick the bottom or catch knives. Average in. If you've only got $10,000, Buy $1,000 a week for the next 10 weeks once you think we're getting near a bottom. That's the sort of advice that we give to people. Uh, for Bitcoin, a lot of people just buy $50 a week and they, they know that over time it generally goes up. So I think that's what I'm looking forward to with the stock market. But mm. 
I, I just think that these investors on Wall Street are a little bit out of touch with reality. They're not healthcare professionals. Right. It's still not priced in for how bad this is likely going to be. I totally agree. Let me, I've got this out of the box strategy and I'd, I'd love to, <laughs> I'd love to get your opinion on it because I'm, my whole thing is instead of asking if something's going up or down in price, although that obviously is important, but the first question you have to ask yourself is, is it cheap or is it expensive? So and when you're looking or when I'm looking at an entry point for some of the stocks that are on my, my watch list, let's say like a Chevron as an example, and I'm asking myself, well, when should I maybe start to buy? Because I do the same thing. I, I, you see this huge crash in the market over the last two weeks, but then you've got to realize that we're still at very, very high levels. The market is still expensive. Historically speaking, when you look at a CAPE ratio or you look at the market cap to GDP, and I think those numbers are, are really important. So do we go down as far as we, we did in 2007 nominally where we get to under 1,000 on the S&P? Uh, it wouldn't surprise me. Do we go lower? Maybe not. But what I'm doing is I'm looking at all these other YouTube channels. And I, I hate to say this because a lot of the, 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 the people, and I'm not going to name any names, obviously, but uh, these are a lot of the, the financial gurus that are really popular with the uh, millennial crowd on YouTube. And, and these gurus are, are the people that have always pushed the, the Tesla stock, the, the, the buy Uber, they're into just setting up their Robin Hood account and just, you know, forget active management. It's all about passive. Just buy the S&P index, buy the S&P index. Stocks always go up over time. Don't worry. This is a great buying opportunity. Just dollar cost average in on the stock market. And if you look at a chart, you know, the stock market always goes up over time. And oddly enough, they, they never go and look at a chart prior to, to 1981. It's always mm -hmm. from 1981 <laughs> until today when we've been in a 40-year down cycle in interest rates. But my point is, I think you probably or the viewers know the types of people that I'm referring to. And then you look at their comments, and it's the same thing. They're just gung-ho Tesla. They're gung-ho uh, buying the S and P and, and that's, you know, there's a great buying opportunity and stocks always go up over time. So what I'm looking for is going through the comments of every one of their videos and seeing how the comments change. And they, they're still on the bandwagon that this is a great buying opportunity that you need to go in. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity and they're still very bullish. So I'm waiting to see all those people capitulate to where they get to a point, even the gurus, where they say, you know what, guys, I was wrong. It's going to go down forever. The United States is doomed. I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm selling every single stock that I've ever owned. I'm selling all the ETFs that I bought. I'm even selling my shares of Tesla. And when I see that, then I'm thinking, okay, that's the time to go in. What do you think? I think that I've seen that human emotion cycle play out so many times in the crypto market. And we have these very big and clear four-year cycles because of the way Bitcoin has its halving. But we also have them on a smaller time frame where we have these run-ups on altcoins, these sharp sell-offs, and we see people get fearful. Um, we see them regret their investment, and that's often the best time to buy. And uh, I wanted to throw in there that I, I don't usually put out uh, trades on stocks publicly on Twitter and that, but that day when... Tesla went to $1,000 and I just thought, this is wild. I uh, I shorted that one publicly in front of everyone and I think it, I think it dropped Good to $700 in one day, but anyway. Good for you. And yeah, I think it was somewhere down 500, 550 today, which to, to give it its due, it's, it's still up quite a bit. But if I had to guess over the next three weeks to month, what Tesla is going to do, it, it's going to get really ugly, especially when you look up, look at the blow up that we've had in the corporate bond market, I don't think a lot of those, in, you know, we'll call them quote unquote investors, really understand and make the connection between a company like an Uber or a Tesla, a company that just burns cash 
And no matter how great of a company they are, eventually they're going to have to go back to either borrow money or sell equity. They're, they're, they're going to have to generate more capital. And if those credit markets are completely frozen or if the junk bond market, instead of, I don't know what it's trading at, but say it's, it goes from a 4% uh, yield to a 12% yield, well, now all of a sudden, those companies that just one year prior looked like they're going to dominate the market could potentially be in real trouble of maintaining their solvency. Yeah, you have to, as an investor, you have to separate out the the like for a theme or a person, the stock name, their brand logo. You know, I love what Tesla's doing and, and Elon Musk and the, I love, you know, I'm a science nerd and whatnot, but you've got to, I think I look at the stock price and say that's overvalued. So never fall in love with any stock and there's a price uh, that's undervalued and there's a price that's overvalued and some people never make that distinction. They just hear about a stock or an idea or a coin in the crypto land and they just buy it that day. Yeah, I think that's a great place to, to end and that if you're looking at an asset, it's, it's, it's not a function of being bearish or bullish. Everything is a function of price. And although I might kind of harp on Tesla from time to time in my videos, at 10 bucks a share, I like Tesla. <laughs> I might buy it, but a thousand, no thanks. Everything's a function of price. So Alex, I, I sure appreciate your time, buddy. I know it's probably really early in the morning there and uh, can't wait to do it again. So for those of my viewers that this might be the first time seeing you or seeing you on the channel, can you give them information where they can find uh, you or your website or just uh, more about you? Uh, so Alex Saunders on Twitter, I'm quite active there. Uh, Nuggets News is our YouTube channel. Uh, our yep. website is nuggetsnews.com.au. And for those guys that do want extra, we have premium research reports on gold and silver and cryptocurrencies as well. All right, Alex, we'll see you again soon. Thanks a lot, George. See you guys.